The Ice Age was a period of geological history that lasted from 2.6 million years ago to around 11,700 years ago. The Earth was much colder than it is today, with glaciers covering much of the planet. Despite the harsh conditions, many animals thrived during this time, including some of the most fearsome predators ever to walk the Earth. The concept of resurrecting extinct species has always been a source of fascination and intrigue. With advancements in genetics and technology, the possibility of bringing back creatures that once roamed the Earth, such as woolly mammoths and saber-toothed tigers, has been proposed. But what if we were to bring these Ice Age beasts into the present day? Would they be able to survive in our world, with its vastly different climate and ecosystem? Let's take a closer look at some of the most well-known Ice Age animals and see what it would take for them to survive in the modern world. Dire Wolf Dire wolves were giant dogs that lived 125,000 to 9,500 years ago. This spanned the late Pleistocene and early Holocene. These prehistoric predators were similar to today's wolves, but a bit larger in size, with a sturdier, more robust frame. Two species of dire wolf existed that we know of. A Nacion dirus gildei weighed 60 kilograms, or 132 pounds and Anasion dirus dirus was slightly larger at about 68 kilograms or 150 pounds. In comparison, today's gray wolves, Canis lupus, averaged 40 kilograms or 88 pounds. Although they were a similar size to modern wolves, dire wolves had bigger teeth and a greater bite force. This was likely an adaptation to the prey species available to them at the time and the need to bring down larger animals. Recently, scientists have sequenced the genomes of dire wolves and compared them to gray wolves. To their surprise, the two were not closely related. It was originally assumed that dire wolves and gray wolves were genetically similar with a shared lineage. However, the last common ancestor of these two canines was 5.7 million years ago. Dire wolves are more closely related to jackals than they are to actual wolves. But with such striking similarities to gray wolves, this is a classic example of convergent evolution. A case where two separate species evolve independently from one another, but emerge with similar characteristics due to the similar nature of their environments. So, what happened to the dire wolves? Whilst dire wolves were certainly the top dogs in North America for more than 100,000 years, by 9,500 years ago they faced extinction. They may have looked, sounded, and behaved like gray wolves, but they lacked one key element in the gray wolf's repertoire that could have saved them from extinction, and that was adaptability. Dire wolves hunted specific prey, and their extinction followed the loss of the megafauna from North America, whilst gray wolves evolved in the harsher climates of Eurasia, giving them a greater ability to adapt before traveling across to North America. The dire wolves did not. Instead, they were highly adapted to the North American climate and all that it had to offer. It is also clear from scientific studies that dire wolves never interbred with gray wolves or coyotes. This could have given their genetic lineage a chance, but it was not to be. So, if dire wolves had survived past the early Holocene, would they have survived the world we live in today? To answer this question, we need to look at their habitat, climate, and food source and compare them to what's available today. Firstly, Habitat Dire wolves were endemic to North and South America and parts of East Asia. Their fossils have been found all over the United States from the Pacific to the Atlantic coasts and central and southern regions. They seem to have occupied a range of habitats. These include open plains and grasslands, forested mountainous regions of North America, arid savannas in South America, and even the steppes of Eastern Asia. It is likely that they followed their prey to these geographical locations and that there were some limiting barriers to their geographical expansion, such as the extreme cold of the far north. Some speculate that dire wolves originated in North America owing to the greatest number of fossils found there, more potential ancestors and fossils dating back earlier than those found elsewhere. It is assumed that, from North America, dire wolves dispersed and spread southwards into South America via the Andean Corridor, 
This would have most likely have occurred during a glacial period, because the climate during an interglacial would have consisted of tropical rainforest, rather than open, arid savanna. Today, there would be similar habitats available. Most of the open plains or forested regions of North America are segregated into protected national parks. If dire wolves existed today, they would likely be confined to these parks, and their numbers would have to be limited to avoid prey overkill. So what about climate? How different was the late Pleistocene climate from today? Did the dire wolf adapt to any environmental fluctuations? During the late Pleistocene, North America experienced significant fluctuations in climate. In the beginning, it was relatively mild and stable, similar to that of today. However, as the epoch progressed, the climate became increasingly colder and more variable, which repeated glacial advances and retreats. During the peak of the last glaciation, approximately 20,000 years ago, ice sheets covered much of Canada and the northern United States. The northern regions of the continent were generally cold and dry, while the southern regions were cooler and wetter than they are today. Temperatures in these regions were significantly colder than they are today. For example, in parts of the Arctic, temperatures may have been as much as 20 to 30 degrees Celsius, or 36 to 54 degrees Fahrenheit colder than current temperatures. This might mean if dire wolves existed today, they would struggle with the warmer temperatures, or it might mean that their geographical range would change. They may head northwards where it's colder but prey species nearer the Arctic may not be plentiful enough. If they could cross into parts of Siberia where the temperatures are much colder than in North America, they may be more adapted to the climate. Siberia offers a range of habitats that would suit dire wolves such as forests, tundra, and vast expanses of grassland. It is already home to wolves, suggesting that it could also be suitable for dire wolves. Species that could be considered prey for dire wolves also live in Siberia's wilderness. These include reindeer, elk, and even bears. So this leads to the final question of diet. Would there be suitable food for dire wolves to survive today? Dire wolves were carnivores. Fossilized evidence suggests that their predominant prey was the horse. Those available at the time were western horses, which were larger than today's wild horses and more like today's plain zebra. To a lesser degree, dire wolves also ate dwarf proghorn, giant ground sloths, bison, camels, and occasionally mastodons and mammoths. They were similar to gray wolves in their feeding behavior, except for their killing technique, in which they held on to their prey for longer during the kill. Although ground sloths no longer exist today, horses and their relatives, as well as bison, can be found in the Americas. These animals could be considered prey for the dire wolves if they live today. They typically fed on prey much larger than themselves, which suggests that they hunted in packs and likely had organized social structure in these groups. Towards the end of the Pleistocene and into the Holocene, many fossilized specimens are found with a greater amount of tooth breakage. This suggests that they ate a lot of the carcass including the bone, perhaps more so than in previous generations, as competition for food became fierce with the changing climate. However, the dire wolves were unlikely to have been directly in competition with other great predators of the Pleistocene epoch. Hunting at the same time would have been saber-toothed cats, but these felids would have preferred to hunt in more closed habitats than the dire wolves. Scientists have noted changes in the size of dire wolves over time. As the climate fluctuated, so too did the size of the dire wolves. When the climate was warmer, fossilized skulls found in La Brea tar pits were smaller. Scientists believe this was in response to the stressed ecosystem under the warmer conditions, resulting in stunted growth of predators. If dire wolves survive today, they may look significantly different from their ancestors. They may be smaller and more agile. They would likely hunt the same species that today's wolves hunt and occupy similar niches. At around the same time that the large predators were struggling to find enough food, coyotes dramatically changed their feeding behavior. This was in response to a changing environment and the reduction in and ultimately extinction of many herbivores. Coyotes shifted to eat more plant material, smaller prey species, and utilize more of the carcass. This flexibility and adaptability resulted in the coyote's survival. The same cannot be said for the dire wolf. In conclusion, 
it would be difficult for dire wolves to survive today. They were once apex predators, a canine to be feared, but the climate change wiped out their prey, and they soon followed. There would likely be some areas on Earth today that would provide suitable climate, habitat, and prey for dire wolves. If they were to be brought back to life, their numbers would have to be heavily managed, as would the sanctuaries or reserves in which they lived. They could decimate wild herbivores and outcompete the native predators that did survive the shift from the Pleistocene to the Holocene. Although the dire wolves appear similar to gray wolves, they are only distantly related, and it was the gray wolf that made it through the changing earth, not the dire wolf. American Lion During the last ice age, lions covered an enormous geographical range. Not only did they inhabit Africa and Asia like they do today, but they were also found in Europe and North America. The lions living in North America were called American lions, Panthera leo atrox. There is debate regarding the ancestral lineage of the American lions. Genetic analysis of their fossils suggests that they evolved from the Eurasian cave lions that crossed the Beringia land bridge into North America. Morphological characteristics from the skull and dentistry reveal that the American lion was more closely related to the African lion and tiger than it was to the jaguar. The American lion diverged from Eurasian cave lions about 340,000 years ago. The American lion became extinct approximately 12,000 years ago, along with the mass extinction of the megafauna. These include prey species such as the woolly mammoth and mastodon. It is still unclear exactly why so many animals became extinct towards the end of the last ice age. Most scientists accept that it was a combination of both dramatic climate change and the competition with early humans. Although large predatory species such as the American lion and the saber-toothed cats may not have directly competed with humans, there may have been increased competition for their prey. We know from fossil records that this extinct lion was larger than today's Asian and African lions. It stood at 4 feet tall and 8 feet long. It had long legs with retractable claws. We also know from fossil evidence that American lions were a formidable predator that roamed during the Pleistocene epoch. But the question is, could they survive today? In order to answer this question, we need to look at a number of factors that determine a species' survivability. These include, but are not limited to, habitat, prey availability, competition, and climate. Firstly, habitat. No fossils of American lions have been found where boreal forests dominated the landscape during the Pleistocene. From this, paleontologists conclude that American lions lived almost exclusively in open grasslands. They lived and hunted in open plains and often dragged their prey back to rocky dens. In current-day America, the Great Plains found west of the Mississippi River and east of the Rocky Mountains would provide a similar habitat for the lions. But would this be big enough for American lions to roam? The home range of American lions is not known, but in African lions, it varies enormously. It has been shown to be as little as 25 kilometers squared and as much as 2,000 kilometers squared. The size of a carnivore's range is determined by a trade-off between energy expenditure used in maintaining a territory and food availability. The Great Plains have the potential to provide food for American lions. However, what was once a vast landscape containing roaming herds of bison and other herbivores has now become fragmented with agricultural land. Some of the national parks and reserves could also provide a suitable habitat for these large carnivores, but the number of these apex predators and availability of prey would have to be carefully managed, as they are in many African reserves. There are certainly vast areas of wilderness in North America today that could provide habitat for American lions. Whether those areas would be considered enough for the lion's home range is questionable. As the human population expands and anthropogenic activities put increasing pressure on the environment, national parks and reserves may provide the only habitat suitable for these giant prehistoric cats. Secondly, prey availability needs to be considered. Evidence suggests that American lions hunted very large prey, such as young mammoths, giant ground sloths, and bison. Some scientists have concluded from the fossils found in Ranchero La Brea tar pits 
that American lions were social animals. They hunted in prides, like their African relatives. This has been concluded from the high number of young male specimens found in the tar pits and the physiology of the limbs. These findings point towards group hunting and group behavior. Today, herbivores in North America such as bison, moose, elk, and deer could be considered prey for American lions. Once widespread across America and numbering in the millions, bisons are now only found in national parks, state parks, and reserves. There are an estimated 31,000 remaining in America, with the only truly wild bison found in Yellowstone National Park. These are thought to be descended from those of the Pleistocene era, although the introduction of American lions would put considerable strain on the American bison populations, there would likely be enough smaller species of prey available. White-tailed deer would be an abundant food source for the lions. They are found in every U.S. state except for Alaska, and there are thought to be between 25 and 30 million. White and black-tailed deer currently fall prey to mountain lions. These cats are not actually lions, but instead pumas. It is debatable whether prey would compete with American lions for habitat and food if they coexisted. This leads on to the third factor that needs to be considered for the American lion survival – competition. In North America, the natural predators of moose and elk are typically wolves, brown bears, and occasionally mountain lions. If American lions were introduced to the area, they would be competing for food with these established predators. Mountain lions require a vast area of wilderness to thrive. Their range is 13 times greater than that of a black bear. They are found in mountains, forests, deserts, and wetlands, anywhere there is shelter and plentiful prey. American lions typically lived in open grasslands. Until recently, it was thought that mountain lions were solitary animals, only coming together to breed and raise young. However, they have been recorded sharing carcasses and are known to have a hierarchy amongst those within the same range. Despite this, they probably wouldn't outcompete American lions for food. The American lions were thought to hunt collectively in prides. They would probably be more effective at making kills than mountain lions. They were larger and able to hunt together, making them able to target larger prey than mountain lions. Perhaps American lions would remain in open grasslands hunting bigger animals, whilst mountain lions would continue to live in their varied habitats, taking down smaller prey. There would be considerable competition for space and prey with other predators already established in North America. However, it is possible that American lions could coexist with these species. In Africa, lions live alongside other predatory species. Leopards, hyenas, wild dogs, and cheetahs are just a few of the carnivorous species living in Africa, although they each occupy different niches and hunt or scavenge in their own unique ways. They live in close proximity to one another and often feed on the same animals. Populations of the mountain lion have decreased significantly since the 1800s. They have fallen victim to hunting and habitat loss. Due to conflicts with livestock, Mountain lions were hunted and almost eradicated from the eastern states. It is plausible that American lions would follow in a similar vein, threatening livestock and struggling with habitat loss. Finally, we need to consider the climate. The climate during the Pleistocene was highly variable. It was characterized by irregular cycles of glacial and interglacial periods. As a result, temperatures fluctuated by as much as 50 degrees Fahrenheit within a few decades. During glacial periods within the Pleistocene, up to 30% of the Earth's surface was covered by glaciers. Ice during these times spread from the Arctic Circle as far south as modern-day Illinois and Missouri. Global temperatures were about 11 degrees Fahrenheit cooler than they are today, and the world was a drier place. Rainfall across the globe was about half of what it is today, and sea levels were lower. The American lion would have been adapted to survive these conditions. Interglacial periods during the Pleistocene were reminiscent of the current climate. This suggests that species from that era could, from a climatic perspective, survive today. As well as the megafauna found during the Pleistocene, there were also many familiar species. Brown bears, caribou, and wolves were also roaming North America during the last ice age. Whilst these smaller species survived to the present day, the megafauna, including American lions, died out as the Pleistocene ended and the Earth entered the Age of Man.
In conclusion, although there could be enough food and space for American lions to live side by side with modern day predators, there was a reason they did not survive past the Pleistocene. Whether this reason was climate change or overkill from humans, the American lions have had their time and their niche has now been filled. Short-Faced Bear The short-faced bears that once roamed North America belong to the genus Arctotus. Two species were found on the continent during the Pleistocene. The lesser short-faced bear, Arctotus pristinus, which predominantly lived during the early Pleistocene, and the giant short-faced bear, Arctotus simus, which predominantly lived towards the end of the Pleistocene. Both species likely overlapped with each other, but Arctotus simus evolved from Arctotus pristimus. The bears were similar in appearance to today's bears, but considerably larger. The biggest was the giant short-faced bear, which could grow up to 950 kilograms, or 2,000 pounds in weight had a shoulder height of 1.6 meters, or 5.2 feet, and when standing on its hind legs, could reach heights of 4 meters, or 13 feet. Although they are considered to have been omnivores like many of today's bears, they are thought to be the largest carnivorous land mammals that ever lived. Here, we ask the question, could short-faced bears survive nowadays? To answer this question, we need to consider the bear's habitat, climate, and diet and compare these to what's available today. Firstly, habitat. The lesser short-faced bear, Arctotus pristinus, was largely found in today's Florida. It preferred to live in open grassland habitats that were largely dominated by longleaf pine flatwoods. As Florida's wet, forested habitat gave way to a drier, more open environment during the climatic shifts that occurred towards the middle of the Pleistocene the lesser short-faced bears vanished. It is thought that the descendants, the giant short-faced bear, lived in a range of habitats from grasslands to tropical thorn shrub and woodland. In Mexico, it lived in an open forest dominated by low, bushy evergreen junipers. In California, the bear's habitat shifted from wetter mixed woodland, grassland, and marshes to more arid, mixed savannas as the Pleistocene continued. Most of Canada was covered in glaciers, but occasionally an ice-free corridor would emerge, allowing animals to migrate. During these times, Arctotus fossils have been found in northern Canada and Beringia, where some species such as lions, brown bears, and homotherium became locally extinct, Arctotus remained. During the Pleistocene, it seems that the short-faced bears were a highly adaptable species. They survived and thrived in a wide and diverse range of habitats, and even as the habitats and climate shifted as the Pleistocene progressed, the bears continued to occupy the same niches. Today, conditions may be different from those of the Pleistocene, but there is a chance the short-faced bears could survive in the habitats available. As the climate warmed, the glaciers that covered much of North America began to retreat leaving behind a landscape that was shaped by glacial deposits and erosion. In the warmer, ice-free climate, forests began to expand across much of North America, replacing grasslands and other habitats. Changes in precipitation have led to changes in river systems, with some rivers shifting their courses and others drying up completely. The short-faced bears occupied habitats that are present today. Woodlands and open grasslands are still found throughout North America, and would provide the sort of suitable habitat for these prehistoric bears. So, let's now consider the climate. During the last glacial maximum, about 20,000 years ago, the global temperatures were about 6 degrees Celsius, cooler than they are today. The world was a drier place, with a lot of the world's water locked up in glaciers. The sea levels were lower, and rainfall was half of what it is today. This created a different climate and environment compared to today, in which short-faced bears thrived. Their thick, shaggy coats helped keep them warm in the cooler temperatures. They would have had substantial fat reserves to survive the colder climates. However, there was less seasonality back then. Unlike today, there were less obvious seasons in North America. The adaptations that short-faced bears had to keep them warm may be too much for them if they live today. Like some of their modern-day relatives, short-faced bears could overheat easily if they exert themselves or were exposed to hotter temperatures. 
This may mean that short-faced bears would change their geographical location to live in more northern regions where the temperatures are cooler. Fossils of Arctotus pristinus have been found mostly in Florida, but also in Kansas, South Carolina, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Mexico. It was most populous in the southeastern states, thereby avoiding competition with the black bears, which were largely found in the northeast during the Pleistocene. What did the bears eat, and would they be able to find the same food today? It is largely accepted that the short-faced bear was omnivorous. It would have eaten a range of berries and plants as well as meat. The hunting strategy, however, is hotly debated. Some researchers have suggested that the long limbs of the short-faced bear were built for running speed. This gave it the name running bear. If this were true, then the animal could chase herbivores across open plains, hunting them down over long distances. But the immense size and heavy body of the bears suggest that, like today's brown bears, they weren't built for speed. They weren't agile, so were unlikely to chase after agile prey. The structure of the bear's backbone, as evidenced by fossil records, shows that they had little flexibility in the spine, and the way the vertebrae are positioned suggests that they were not quick at accelerating. Furthermore, the bears had a plantigrade gait, meaning that their entire foot was placed on the ground when walking or running. Faster predators tend to sprint on their toes, with their heels lifted off the ground. All this leads to the conclusion that the bears didn't chase their prey. A suggestion has been put forward that the prehistoric bears were scavengers. Their fossilized teeth have shown wear and tear, reminiscent of bone cracking. This could also explain their large body size, which would have been used to defend carcasses that they came across. However, the dentition of fossilized short-faced bears is not as worn as that of known scavengers, such as hyenas. The dentition such as the broad, flat molars, and the structure of the mandibular muscles suggest that the short-faced bears were more herbivorous than omnivorous. The plant material they consumed was typically coarse and unselectively grazed. Of course, like many modern bears, it is still assumed that short-faced bears ate meat. Whether they actively hunted the prey is a topic for debate. But tooth marks on prey such as ground sloths and proboscideans confirm that they were at least partly omnivorous. The flora and fauna of North America have changed since the Pleistocene. Indeed, the climate changes, which resulted in a huge shift in the plant species, are thought to be largely responsible for the mass extinction of the megafauna, including short-faced bears. The giant short-faced bear, Arctotus simus, fed on C3 vegetation such as leaves, stems, bark, and flowers from trees, as well as shrubs and grasses. They also consumed the prey species that browsed this vegetation, such as deer, camelids, tapir, bison, and ground sloths. Some scientists have suggested that the changing vegetation may have played a role in the extinction of some megafauna species. For example, some species may have been better adapted to the open grasslands of the Ice Age and may have struggled to compete in the new forested environments. So, could the flora found there today support short-faced bears? It's difficult to say. It depends on how adaptable the species is. There would certainly be enough vegetation to feed these immense beasts, but whether their digestive systems would be able to cope with a new, unfamiliar type of vegetation is another question. Like modern-day black and brown bears, the short-faced bear would be able to prey or scavenge upon the likes of moose or elk. They may also be able to catch and feed on fish like some of today's bears. Would there be enough prey to feed these giant bears today? Depending on their population size, there could be, in certain areas. They may compete with bears that already inhabit the ecosystem, such as North America's brown and black bears and Canada's polar bears. Interestingly, where short-faced bears lived alongside brown bears, particularly in Beringia or Alaska, the smaller, less dominant brown bears were largely herbivorous. The short-faced bears outcompeted their smaller counterparts for prime prey, consuming grazing animals and probably also fish. The same is true for today's brown and black bears. Where brown bears are absent, black bears consume more meat and fish in their diet. But when brown bears inhabit the same area, black bears are less able to fish for salmon and have much smaller territorial ranges. Fossil evidence of Arctotus is quite sparse compared to other predators that lived at the same time. 
As a result, it is thought that these bears lived in low population densities, which would suit them if they survived today, with an ever-shrinking habitat available to them and fewer food resources. Lower population densities could serve them well in today's climate. It seems that Arctotus was an adaptable animal. From the evidence presented from fossil studies, it lived in a wide range of habitats and consumed a rich and varied diet. So why did it become extinct like the other megafauna? Arctotus survived in the Pleistocene Holocene boundary. It was one of the last species of megafauna to become extinct during the Quaternary Extinction Event that removed between 30 and 40 genera from North America. Climate change caused a shift in vegetation. It led to less nutritional plant matter, which is one of the main reasons some species struggled to survive. For Arctotus, however, the dental wear and tear from the fossilized remains don't seem to suggest the genus went hungry. It is thought that short-faced bears had very low genetic diversity. Fossilized specimens found in Ohio were very closely related to specimens found in Beringia, which had been isolated for tens of thousands of years. With a low genetic diversity, the genus was more vulnerable to environmental changes. Although food shortages don't appear to be to blame for the bear's demise, changes in the nutritional quality of the vegetation, along with changes in the habitat, could have attributed to their extinction. Small population sizes and a lack of fresh genes coming into the population would have made them vulnerable to extinction. All in all, it seems that there is a possibility that short-faced bears could survive nowadays. They have a similar lifestyle to today's brown and black bears, occupying similar niches and consuming a similar omnivorous diet. However, as they were unable to adapt to the changing environment that was reminiscent of the Pleistocene-Holocene boundary, they would unlikely be able to survive in the rapidly changing world of today. Smilodon Smilodons are more commonly known as the saber-toothed tiger. Powerful and ferocious, these prehistoric cats once populated North and South America. They were carnivorous predators, hunting large prey such as the woolly mammoth and bison. There were three species of Smilodon that lived from two and a half million years ago until 10,000 years ago. Smilodon gracilis and Smilodon populator were found in South America, and Smilodon fatalis was found in North America. They all belong to an extinct subfamily of Felidae. Their characteristic feature was the elongated canine teeth giving them the well-known name of the saber-toothed cats. The three different species of Smilodon differed significantly in size from one another. The smallest, Smilodon gracilis, was comparable to modern-day jaguars, and Smilodon fatalis was similar to Siberian tigers. Smilodon populador, however, was the largest of all, weighing in at 220 to 360 kilograms. Some fossils of this species have even found them to have weighed up to 400 kilograms. Scientists have been able to study large numbers of Smilodon fossils found in the Los Angeles tar pit at Ranchero La Brea. They've been able to determine that the Smilodon's most likely behavior from skeletal morphology and animal paleopathology is showing the animal's stresses, strains, and injuries. Some scientists suggest that the saber-toothed cat was a social species, similar to that of modern-day lions. This belief has risen from fossils that have been found to have injuries that have healed long before the animal has died. It is assumed that an animal would need assistance to survive an injury in the wild. This suggests Smilodons work together like a pride of lions. The counter-argument to this is that modern-day cats heal quickly without needing help. For example, to eat. Furthermore, Smilodon's relatively small brain is not in keeping with that of a social species. Saber-toothed cats are known to have been ferocious predators. You would have been forgiven for thinking that they were similar to today's big cats. However, their approach to hunting differed slightly. Smilodon had very powerful front limbs, suggesting that these were key to catching prey. Their long, elongated canines were prone to breaking, and so the big cats relied more heavily on immobilizing their prey with their front limbs before biting to kill. They would use their front legs to knock their prey to the ground or cling on and pin them down. Today's big cats often hold onto their prey with their teeth during an attack. 
It was once thought that Smilodon hunted an open grassland, taking down large herbivores such as bison. This myth has now been debunked, and more recent research suggests that Smilodon actually hunted in forests and amongst the shrubbery, rather than chasing prey in the open. Smilodon was more of an ambush predator, using the forest to remain hidden. They fed on large species such as giant ground sloths and the Macrochenia, which looked a bit like a large llama. Hunting in the forest meant that the saber-toothed cats probably didn't compete with grassland-hunting carnivores, such as the dire wolves. Smilodons were around during the Pleistocene, but became extinct by the Pleistocene-Holocene boundary. The climate during the Pleistocene varied and changed enormously. Within a few decades, temperatures fluctuated by as much as 10 degrees Celsius, and there were irregular cycles of glacial and interglacial cold and warm periods. So why did the Smilodon go extinct? Did the rapidly changing environmental conditions lead to their demise? Or did early humans play a role? People believe that overkilling the Smilodon was responsible for its demise. This is because their extinction coincided with the arrival of the first humans to North America. However, this may not be the case. 38 genera became extinct in North America by the end of the Pleistocene. Little to no fossil records show death from human attack on the larger mammals, but there has been plenty of fossil evidence showing humans hunted bison and elk. Bison and elk still survive to this day, so clearly overkill from humans was not to blame. Furthermore, it seems there was limited genetic diversity towards the end of the Pleistocene, caused by the changing climate and shifts in the animal's ranges. Some scientists are looking at the environmental fluctuations that occurred during the Pleistocene to predict outcomes for changes in our current global climate. The pressures faced by the Smilodon and other coexisting species were numerous and complex. The mass extinction towards the end of the Pleistocene included a huge range of animals. Not all large mammals became extinct and some smaller species and trees disappeared too. Some inhabited warmer climates, others endured the cold. Some were herbivores, some omnivores, and some, like the Smilodon, carnivores. Some were social animals, and some were solitary. It is thought that each and every species during the climatic changes of the Pleistocene had to adapt, migrate, or become extinct. It appears some species were better at adapting than others. It seems the Smilodon was not one of them. The smaller predatory species of the Pleistocene, such as the coyotes and wolves, have survived to the modern day, whilst the larger predators, including Smilodon, became extinct 10 to 12,000 years ago. Their extinction could have been, at least partly, attributed to the hotter and more humid climate at the beginning of the Holocene. Their inability to adapt to these changing temperatures could be responsible for their extinction. It is also probable that the specialized diet of the Smilodon contributed to their fate. Species like the coyote adapted to changes by hunting smaller prey and becoming more of a scavenger. Both the dire wolves and the saber-toothed cats showed no sign of changing their dietary preferences in response to the evolving ecology. Smilodon's extinction followed the mass extinction of the prehistoric herbivores, including the mammoths, giant sloths, and mastodons. The smaller predatory species survived by adapting their hunting behavior and becoming physically smaller. Today's coyotes are significantly smaller than their predecessors. The size of a Smilodon did not change throughout the Pleistocene. So, the question here today is, could Smilodon survive nowadays? For such a fearsome and ferocious beast, the Smilodon didn't appear to be very adaptable to climate changes. The current environmental conditions of the Earth are similar to those during the interglacial periods in the Pleistocene. This suggests that, from an environmental and climatic point of view, Smilodon could survive today. Finding prey, however, could be difficult. The exceptionally large species that Smilodon once hunted, such as the woolly mammoth, no longer roam the earth. Smaller animals, like bison and elk, however, can still be found on the North American plains, albeit in much smaller numbers. These were common prey for the saber-toothed cats, 
but the only wild bison now found in North America are within national parks. Yellowstone National Park is the only place to have truly wild bison, thought to be descended from those of the Pleistocene era. In South America, alpacas, llamas, peccaries, capybara, and deer could be considered prey species for the Smilodon. Jaguars currently hunt some of these species and, whilst jaguars didn't compete with Smilodon during the Pleistocene, in today's world they may do. With smaller habitat ranges available and smaller prey animals, apex predators are likely to be forced to compete with each other. The predatory animals currently living in North and South America are surviving and occupying the niche that was once filled by the Smilodon. If saber-toothed cats were able to be reincarnated and reintroduced into the wild, it is unlikely they would survive. The species we have nowadays are more adaptable. When human interference is limited, bears thrive partly due to their broad dietary range. As well as eating meat, they eat berries, insects, and leaves. Wolves are social predators, unlike Smilodon, hunting in packs to take down larger animals. Both of these predators would compete with Smilodon for prey and territory. In South America, the jaguar has decreased in size since the Pleistocene. It has adapted very well to the damp habitat of the rainforest. It prefers to hunt smaller animals, such as rodents and monkeys, and can hold its breath underwater for up to five minutes whilst catching fish. It is difficult to imagine that Smilodon, once a successful apex predator, could survive today. Massive loss of habitat, reduction in the numbers of wild prey, and the presence of successful, more adaptable apex predators suggest Smilodon would struggle to survive. Mammoth Mammoths include a number of extinct elephant-related species that once roamed the Earth. They are most closely related to today's Asian elephants rather than African elephants. They looked similar to other proboscideans. They had long trunks and long, curved tusks. Whilst some species were exceptionally large, standing at 13 feet or 4 meters at the shoulder and weighing over 12 tons, most were smaller and a similar size to today's Asian elephants. The oldest known species is considered to be the South African mammoth, whose fossils date back 5 million years ago, during the early Pliocene. They were common in southern and eastern Africa. From there, mammoths migrated northwards, evolving into other species of the mammoth as they did so. Fossil evidence suggests that southern mammoths gave rise to steppe mammoths in Asia around 1.7 million years ago. Then, much more recently, steppe mammoths gave rise to the woolly mammoth. These species dispersed out of Asia, into Europe, and North America. The mammoths crossed over into North America via the Bering Land Bridge approximately one and a half million years ago. From there, the American mammoths evolved into the Columbian, Jeffersons, and the Channel Islands pygmy mammoths. But more recent DNA evidence disputes the simplicity of this timeline, suggesting there was more of an overlap between species. It is likely with more and more scientific analysis of these incredible animals, our understanding will broaden and their historic story will change over time. What we do know is that these large herbivores were well adapted to the climate of the Pleistocene. These adaptations may not be suitable for today's climate, more on that in a moment. The mammoths that inhabited more northern regions developed long fur to cope with the cold. The most famous of these was the woolly mammoth. These giants evolved several adaptations for surviving temperatures as low as minus 50 degrees Celsius or minus 58 degrees Fahrenheit. They developed a thick layer of subcutaneous fat to keep them warm. Their ears and tails were reduced in size to minimize heat loss, and they grew large humps of fat above their necks, which acted as both a heat source and an energy source. Mammoths were a common sight across the globe during the Pleistocene. But could they survive today? To answer this question, we need to compare the environment in which the mammoths thrived to the environment they would find themselves today. We can look at their habitat and diet, as well as the global climate during the Pleistocene. We also need to consider the competition mammoths were subjected to, and whether the same competition exists today. 
Firstly, let's look at the mammoth's habitat. During the Pleistocene, there were large areas of Eurasia covered in steppe tundra. This was where the woolly mammoths lived. It spread across the northern hemisphere from east to west, reaching as far south as Spain. The mammoths fed on the grasses, sedges, and shrubs that covered the steppe. In North America, the woolly mammoths inhabited this type of tundra as well, but there is fossil evidence that mammoths also inhabited forested regions in America's Midwest. Today, the mammoth steppe no longer exists. Between 42,000 and 6,000 years ago, 90% of mammoth habitat disappeared. The vast grasslands in the north have now been replaced by permafrost, taiga forests, and mossy tundra. These habitats and their vegetation could not support mammoths. There may be pockets of tundra-like grasslands around the world that could be considered suitable habitats for mammoths, although some of these are huge open areas like the Great Plains in North America or the Russian tundra stretching over 4,000 miles. They would unlikely provide the right sort of vegetation to feed these giants. This leads us to consider the diet of the mammoths. Mammoths were strict herbivores like today's elephants. From looking at fossilized teeth and feces, scientists have been able to determine their diet. They have also been able to extract preserved intestinal content from frozen mammoth remains in the Arctic permafrost. The Colombian mammoth ate cactus leaves, trees, and shrubs. This mammoth arose in Central and South America about one million years ago and was bigger and less hairy than the woolly mammoth. The Mongochian mammoth fed predominantly on grasses and sedges with supplementation of dwarf birch and larch twigs and a variety of herbs and mosses. The Eurasian mammoths fed on forbs, which are flowering herbaceous plants. These contained higher protein than other plants. The mammoths foraged for their food underneath the snow and ice. They fed on vegetation that was killed off by the winter frost, uncovering it with their tusks and feet. As the climate shifted towards the end of the last ice age, warmer and wetter conditions favored the less nutritious grasses and woody shrubs. The vegetation of the Arctic tundra changed, and woolly mammoths struggled to adapt to less protein-dense foliage. This change in vegetation could have led to the woolly mammoth's extinction, but there were other factors at play. Not only did the mammoth struggle to find enough to eat, but there was a new predator on the block. Modern-day humans were expanding their range dramatically. If we look at the competition and the threats faced by mammoths during the Pleistocene, many of the same threats still exist today. Whilst the changing climate caused a significant shift in the vegetation available in the mammoth's habitat, early humans are likely to have also contributed to the mammoth's demise. It is unclear how frequently early humans hunted and killed mammoths. Neanderthals were perhaps more successful at hunting these giant beasts. Judging by the evidence scientists have uncovered, both Neanderthals and early humans consumed mammoth meat, and the bones and tusks were used for tools and the construction of buildings. So far, the most accepted reason for the extinction of the mammoths is a combination of climatic and human factors. The majority of mammoths have died out by the end of the Pleistocene or early Holocene. Other threats include predation by some of the Pleistocene's most fearsome meat eaters. Young mammoths were preyed upon by some of the large predators of the era. Saber-toothed cats, cave lions, dire wolves, and cave bears would have hunted mammoths, especially the young and ill. Mammoths would have protected themselves with their tusks and come together as a herd when under attack. It is thought that they had a hierarchical social structure, like today's elephants, with a lead matriarch. Today, predators in the northern hemisphere include tigers, bears, and wolves. Some of these species are smaller than their prehistoric ancestors and would therefore pose less of a threat to a fully grown mammoth. However, those species that participate in cooperative hunting, like wolves, may be able to hunt down and tire down an adult mammoth or kill young or injured individuals. Fossil evidence suggests that a couple of isolated populations of woolly mammoths survived until as recently as 4,000 years ago. These populations were on St. Paul Island, Alaska, and an Arctic island called Wrangell Island off the northern coast of Russia. These isolated mammoths were safe from predators, but were thought to have died out from inbreeding and a lack of genetic diversity, as well as from the pressures of a changing climate. 
Today, many species are under threat of extinction from the same pressures. Hunting by humans, encroaching on natural habitats, and the changing climate has seen the extinction of 160 species in the last 10 years. The negative impact of human expansion and encroachment on natural wilderness is a common theme when it comes to the demise of prehistoric and modern-day species. If mammoths were still alive today, their existence, like many other modern-day species, would likely be under threat. In conclusion, we don't believe that mammoths would be able to survive today. They are not adapted to the warmer, wetter climate of the Holocene, and their primary source of vegetation has been lost. They may be able to find pockets of refugia in some of the world's most isolated open landscapes, but it is unclear whether they would be able to survive on the vegetation found in these areas. Scientists have hinted at the possibility of being able to reincarnate the woolly mammoth, using preserved DNA from fossilized remains, and filling in the blanks with modern-day elephants. They suggest it may be possible to one day see a real-life mammoth roaming once more, although this would be an incredible sight. The mammoths have had their time on this Earth. The current Holocene presents a very different environment than that of the Pleistocene. The mammoths would likely struggle to survive, and their reincarnation would purely be for our enjoyment. Perhaps we should put more effort into preserving the species that are currently fighting for survival on this planet we, and so many others, call home. Marsupial Lion With its ferocious appearance, powerful jaws, and retractable claws, Phylacolio, also known as the marsupial lion, was the ultimate predator of the Pleistocene epoch. Its muscular body could grow up to 1.5 meters, or 4.9 feet in height, and it could weigh up to 160 kilograms, or 350 pounds. Despite its impressive size, the marsupial lion was a nimble and agile predator that could take down prey much larger than itself. Phylacolio's retractable claws were particularly impressive, as they allowed the predator to climb up trees and ambush prey from above. Its powerful jaws could deliver a crushing bite, which was particularly useful for taking down large herbivores such as giant kangaroos and a protodon, a giant wombat-like marsupial. But Thylacolio's hunting strategies and physical adaptations were not the only factors that made it such an impressive predator. It was also a highly intelligent animal, capable of adapting to changing environmental conditions and seeking out new sources of prey. It was a solitary hunter, and its social behavior was limited to mating and raising young. Thylacolio also had an excellent sense of smell and hearing, which made it a formidable predator in the dense forests and grasslands of prehistoric Australia. However, Despite its many strengths, the marsupial lion eventually went extinct around 30,000 years ago. The main cause of its extinction was the disappearance of its prey, which was likely linked to changing climatic conditions. But could Phylacolio survive in today's world, where the climate and prey availability has changed significantly? To answer this question, we need to compare the environment in which the marsupial lions thrived to the environment they would find themselves today. We can look at their habitat and diet, as well as the global climate during the Pleistocene. We also need to consider competition Thylacolio was subjected to and whether the same competition exists today. Firstly, let's look at the Thylacolio's habitat. Thylacolio was an incredibly adaptable predator, capable of thriving in a range of different habitats, from dense forests to open grasslands. But would it be able to adapt to the changing climate of today's world? During the Pleistocene epoch, Australia experienced a wide range of climatic conditions, from warm and wet to cold and dry. The marsupial lion was adapted to a relatively arid and unpredictable environment, where it had to cope with seasonal droughts and limited water sources. In today's world, however, Australia's climate has changed significantly, with temperatures rising and rainfall patterns becoming more unpredictable. Despite these changes, it is possible that Thylacolio could adapt to the new environmental conditions. Its ability to climb trees and ambush prey from above could be particularly advantageous in the dense forests and woodlands that still exist today. Additionally, Thylacolio was capable of going without water for extended periods, and its kidneys were adapted to conserve water, 
which could be beneficial in areas where water sources are limited. However, Thylacolia would face some significant challenges in adapting to today's climate. For one, the hotter and drier conditions would likely limit the availability of prey, particularly large herbivores. Thylacolio's preferred prey, such as giant kangaroos and the protodon, were adapted to the cooler and wetter conditions of the Pleistocene, and their populations have declined significantly in recent times. Thylacolia would need to adapt to new prey sources, which could be challenging given its specialized hunting strategies and dietary requirements. Additionally, human activities such as hunting and habitat destruction have significantly impacted the populations of many native animals, further reducing the available prey for marsupial lions. While Thylacolia was a highly adaptable predator, it would face significant challenges in adapting to the changing climate and environmental conditions of today's world. Its ability to climb trees and conserve water would be advantageous, but the decline of its preferred prey and the competition from other large predators would make survival challenging. This leads us to consider the diet of Thylacolio. Thylacolio had a specialized diet that included large herbivores like giant kangaroos and the protodon, which were the dominant herbivores of Australia during the Pleistocene epoch. These animals were large enough to sustain a predator the size of a marsupial lion. Thylacolio's hunting strategy was to ambush its prey from above using its powerful forelimbs to hold its victim still, while it delivered a fatal bite to the throat. This strategy requires a large and powerful animal to succeed, and it was a key factor in Thylacolio's success as a predator. However, the extinction of the megafauna of Australia, which occurred around 50,000 years ago, has limited the availability of prey species for Thylacolio. The reasons for the extinction of these animals are still debated, but human activity likely played a significant role, either through hunting or habitat destruction. As a result, many of the prey species that Thylacolio relied on for its survival no longer exist. Today, smaller herbivores like wallabies and possums still exist in Australia, but they are not large enough to sustain a predator the size of Thylacolio. In addition, Thylacolio's specialized hunting strategies would require it to be able to sneak up on its prey, undetected, which could be challenging given the abundance of other predators and the increased human presence in many areas. Nonetheless, there are some potential prey species that Thylacolio could feed on in today's world. For example, feral pigs and deer have been introduced to Australia by humans and have become widespread in many areas. These animals are larger than many native herbivores and could provide a substantial meal for Thylacolio. Thylacolio could also scavenge the remains of other animals, as it was known to do during the Pleistocene epoch. However, the availability of prey would be highly dependent on the specific location and habitat where Thylacolio was living. In areas with suitable prey and habitat, Thylacolio could potentially survive by adapting its hunting strategies and diet. However, in areas where prey is scarce or competition from other predators is high, Thylacolio would face significant challenges in finding enough food to survive. Thylacolio, as an apex predator during the Pleistocene epoch, had no serious competition in Australia. However, the situation would be different in today's world. Thylacolio would have to compete with various other predators for food and resources, as well as face other threats such as habitat destruction, introduced species, and climate change. One of Thylacolio's most significant competitors would be the dingo, which is a wild dog that was brought to Australia by humans about 4,000 years ago. Dingoes are known for their hunting skills and have preyed on various animals, including wallabies, possums, kangaroos, and feral pigs. Moreover, dingoes have the ability to adapt to different environments, from forests to deserts. Another potential threat to Thylacolio would be large pythons found in northern Australia. These pythons are formidable predators and can hunt and kill prey, including wallabies and small kangaroos. Furthermore, pythons have a high degree of adaptability and can survive in various environments, such as forests, grasslands, and even urban areas. Apart from the competition, Thylacolio would also face threats from humans who have significantly altered the Australian environment since the Pleistocene epoch. Urbanization and agriculture have destroyed much of the native habitat, which has had a devastating impact on native wildlife. Moreover, humans have introduced exotic species such as feral cats and foxes, 
which have caused significant damage to the native ecosystem. Another serious threat to thylacolio is climate change, which has already started impacting Australia's wildlife. The frequency and severity of droughts, heat waves, and brush fires have made it increasingly difficult for many native species to survive. The extent of the impact on thylacolia would depend on the specific habitat and location it inhabited. In areas where the impact of climate change is severe, thylacolio would struggle to find food and water, making its survival uncertain. In conclusion, thylacolio was an impressive and unique predator that once ruled the Australian landscape. While thylacolio's hunting abilities and physical strength were impressive, it would face significant challenges in surviving in today's world. Competition from other predators, habitat destruction, introduced species, and climate change are all significant threats that thylacolio would have to contend with. Therefore, it is unlikely that thylacolio would be able to survive in today's world. Although it is fascinating to imagine this remarkable predator still roaming the Australian wilderness, the truth is that thylacolio has become extinct, leaving behind only fossils and a legacy of awe-inspiring ferocity. Giant Ground Sloth Megatherium was a prehistoric ground sloth. Its name comes from Greek, meaning great beast, and what a beast it was. One species, known as the giant ground sloth Megatherium americanum, weighed up to 4 tons, or 8,800 pounds. It measured 5 meters or 20 feet from head to tail, and had a shoulder height when on all fours of 2.1 meters, or 6 feet 11 inches. The genus survived in the Americas during the Pliocene and throughout the Pleistocene. They became extinct 12,000 years ago, along with much of America's megafauna. The giant ground sloth evolved in South America, cut off from the other continents. The animals in this part of the world evolved into some incredible specimens that fascinate scientists today. When the Central American land bridge formed 3 million years ago, the fauna was able to move between North and South America. As ground sloths migrated northwards, they gave rise to new species of sloth, such as Megalonyx, a 10-foot, 2,200-pound animal that reached as far north as Alaska. Megatherium largely walked on all fours, on the sides of their feet. Their large claws prevented them from placing their feet flat on the ground. They could move their hind legs and stand, using their tail for balance, to reach leaves and branches high up in the trees. Some suggest that, like modern-day elephants, Megatherium was hairless owing to its huge body size and propensity to overheat. Others depict it as having long, shaggy fur. Unlike today's sloths that are small in comparison and live in trees, the giant ground sloths, as their name suggests, resided on the ground. With the genus surviving and thriving for millions of years, the question arises, could Megatherium survive nowadays? We know the planet is a very different place from the Pliocene and Pleistocene, but could the diet, habitats, and climate that are available today be suitable for this prehistoric giant? Let's consider each. Firstly, diet. Modern-day sloths are omnivores. They eat leaves and twigs up in the trees, as well as seed pods, but they also eat insects and occasionally other small vertebrates. But for Megatherium, the question of diet is not so clear-cut. Scientific research analyzed the collagen of fossilized bones from Megatherium. From this, it was suggested that Megatherium was exclusively vegetarian. It was able to stand on its hind legs to reach up to the highest branches of trees. It would then use its huge claws to pull down branches for them to feed on the leaves. Being so big and being able to reach so tall, Megatherium probably had little competition for food, as smaller herbivores wouldn't have been able to browse so high. The giant ground sloths had powerful, robust jaws and strong teeth which would have enabled them to feed on tough vegetation. They may have used their long claws to dig up roots as well. However, some believe it was omnivorous like its modern-day relatives. Its 7-inch claws could have been used to take down prey or rip meat from a carcass. Like their smaller tree-dwelling descendants, they were slow-moving. To eat meat, they would either have to scavenge or hunt other slow-moving animals. Some suggest they actively hunted and ate the armadillo-like animals, Galiptodonts. Flipping these armored herbivores over and then using their claws to kill it has been suggested by some, but there is no fossil evidence for this. 
only what can be concluded from the animal's dentition. Their teeth were sharper and triangular shaped rather than flat. This suggests that they were used for cutting and grinding. It is not implausible to suggest that they occasionally fed on carrion in order to supplement their otherwise vegetarian diet. Whether Megatherium ate meat or not remains a matter of debate, but one thing is for sure. It predominantly relied on plant matter to sustain its huge body size. Modern-day sloths feed on leaves and flowers from plants, such as the trumpet tree and barragon. They have adapted to life in the trees. Hanging upside down for most of the day, they rarely travel along the ground, and when they do, it isn't for foraging or browsing like their giant ancestors. It is likely that the giant sloths fed on similar flora and were able to reach up high to the branches that modern-day sloths consume. Some of the foliage found throughout North and South America, such as conifers and oak, were available when Megatherium was alive. It may have browsed these plants and would still be able to today but their quantity might not be enough to sustain a healthy population of giant ground sloths. These animals ate vast volumes of food every day to maintain their huge size. If they were alive today, their impact on the habitat might be akin to elephants, which are sometimes called to prevent them from damaging too many trees in an area. They may also outcompete other herbivorous animals that have adapted to a similar niche. Next, we need to consider the climate and habitat for Megatherium. Megatherium inhabited woodland and grassland habitats. Towards the end of the Pleistocene, they lived in the South American Pampas, an area rich in fertile soil, characterized by vast, open grassland plains. If Megatherium was alive today, it would need to have access to untouched forests and open grasslands. The vegetation cover of South, Central, and North America has changed considerably since the Pleistocene. Although some species of plants that we know today were around during the Pleistocene, there have been dramatic shifts in plant life. When the Earth went through several glacial and interglacial cycles, the climate changed. As the climate cooled and glaciers expanded, more moisture was locked up as ice. This resulted in less precipitation and more arid conditions across most of North and South America. Megatherium would have survived the climate changes. The genus was able to adapt to the fluctuating levels of rainfall and temperature changes. The vegetation during the Pliocene was largely forested. It consisted of lowland rainforests, montane forests, and rainforests. Later on in the Pleistocene, grassland savannas replaced tropical forests in the southern Amazon basin. The repeated cycle of humid and arid conditions dramatically changed the vegetation. During the last glacial maximum, 20,000 years ago, the temperature was cooler, precipitation limited, and carbon dioxide levels lower than today, all of which affected plant life. Isolated fragmented forested regions affected the biota that lived within them. Glaciers created physical boundaries that restricted animals from migrating. This historical landscape influenced the flora and fauna found throughout the Americas today. But could Megatherium live in the climate and habitat dominant in North and South America these days? Today, most of South America is covered in tropical, temperate, and dry desert biomes. It is home to the longest mountain range in the world. Megatherium survived the fluctuating temperatures and changing climate throughout the Pliocene and Pleistocene. It is difficult to say whether this giant omnivore would be able to cope with our ever-warming modern world. The habitats available throughout the Americas are more fragmented than ever. The Amazon rainforest covers 40% of South America and the savannas more than 800,000 square miles. But would this be enough? It is plausible to think that Megatherium could survive the climate today, given that the genus survives such a range of conditions and environmental changes over the millennia. But overall, despite the wetter conditions of the Pliocene and subsequent glacial and interglacial cycles during the Pleistocene, the last 2 million years of Megatherium's existence was 5 to 10 degrees Celsius cooler than it is today. If given the time, the genus may be able to adapt to the warmer temperatures we experience nowadays. In conclusion, we think the giant ground sloth would struggle to survive today. Fossil records show that these incredible animals were hunted by man. It is generally accepted that climate change as well as hunting led to the demise of America's megafauna at the turn of the epic. But in the case of ground sloths, there is extensive evidence of human interference. Maybe, if given protection from hunting, the right space, 
and vegetation. This prehistoric giant could survive in sanctuaries, but they would be unlikely to survive in the wild. They have had their time, and like so many other animals after them, their decimation has been, at least partly, due to humans and their activities, which is a sad thing to consider. That's all for today! If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share it with your friends. You can also leave a comment with what you would like to see in the following videos. Thanks for watching! See you next time!